Inspiration and wonder at who you are. You are a holy God. We adore you. We thank you for the privilege that we have of coming into your very throne room, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. You are holy. We proclaim that this morning as a church, and we invite you to presence yourself in a very special way in our midst. We love you, Lord. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, friends. Lovely to be with you again. Thanks very much to the worship team for that song selection. I think it was very apt for what I intend to share with you this morning. But before I jump in, I just uh, wanted to let you know that I will not be with you for the next two weeks. So, Lord willing, next week, Saturday, I will be jumping on an airplane and heading off to Nashville in the U.S., uh, for those of you who may not be aware, my primary role and responsibility is with the South African Theological Seminary. It's the institution I work for, and I serve as the ambassador for that institution, and so I do a lot of travel and exhibition and conferencing and all sorts of exciting things. And uh, one of my hobbies is to build acoustic guitars, and so I'll be going to this conference. It's a worship-oriented conference. It happens in Nashville, of all places. <laughs> uh, it's, it's called the Sing Conference. It's hosted by Getty Music. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gettys. I really would encourage you to look them up. But I've built an instrument that we will be giving away as, um, as sets at this event, and so I'm really excited. And uh, so I would covet your prayers for safe journeys and for a good event. So I'll be away for two weeks. And we'll join you again, Lord willing, after that. And so with that out the way, we come to our message for this morning. And as you may be aware, we have been journeying through the Lord's Prayer. And last week, as I shared with you, I spoke a little bit about the occasion for the Lord's Prayer and spoke about how the book of Luke and the book of Matthew both have bits of information um, that the other book does not have. And when you start to piece these together, you start to see um, a bigger picture of what was happening. And um, we saw in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus had been away in a certain place. And when you consider how the narrative unfolds, it's quite clear that he had not been in some of the places that the other rabbis were. It's quite possible that he had been in a secret place praying in solitude, and when he arrives back, his disciples are looking at this and saying, well, this is not quite fitting with what we see the other people doing, and so they say to him, would you teach us to pray? And so then we looked at Matthew, and we saw that Jesus begins by responding, and he says, this is how you should not do things. So he tells them how not to pray. And we saw how it was customary at the time for observant Jews to pray set prayers at specific times of the day in the synagogue. And I shared with you how it was a great honor if you were invited to be the person to lead those prayers. But of course, I also shared how there were some people who, when they were not leading these prayers, were purposefully planning their movements and intentionally timing them so that they would be at the most public place at the time when prayers were to take place, and then they would launch into prayer, drawing attention to themselves. And Jesus rebukes this hypocrisy, and he says to them, you should pray in private, and you should not be heaping up empty, mindless words. And he goes on to give them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And I shared with you that the Lord's Prayer is not an end in and of itself. If it was just another set prayer that Jesus gave them to pray, it would be a contradiction to what he's just said to them. Don't just heap up mindless, empty words, praying with many words, thinking that you'll be heard for your many words. It was intended to be a model a blueprint, a map, as it were, to help us think rightly about God 
and about ourselves and about others as we craft our own individual prayers. And so we've so far seen that we begin when we pray by thinking rightly about who God is. He is our Father. But of course, it is not enough to think rightly just about who he is. We must also think rightly about where he is. And this is what we looked at last week, where we looked at the fact that he is in heaven. And we saw that this concept of heaven is, is intended to elevate our minds and to contemplate the fact that God is not only transcendent, but he is also imminent. And we saw the fact that heaven is not some far off place in some distant galaxy as though if we knew the destination we could launch a rocket ship and get there. We spoke about how heaven is the abode of God. And if God is everywhere present and if he is even present within us, there is a sense in which heaven is everywhere. Just existing in a different plane or a different dimension outside of the categories of space and time. And I enjoyed having a chat with Uncle Tom this week about this concept of heaven. And uh, I couldn't help but think of the implications of this concept of heaven being in a different realm. It kind of brings to light some of the things we read about in the, in the scriptures. You know, when Jesus is at his baptism, you don't see the Father and the Holy Spirit saying, well, you know, <clears throat> we need to get going. We have light years to travel to be there in time. No, the Bible says that the heavens were torn open. And the Holy Spirit appears in the form of a dove and he descends on the person of Jesus. There's the sense in which it's right here. And he just tears open the veil just for a moment and appears. What a wonderful thought. And so when we pray, it's good to keep in mind that we have a heavenly Father who is above all things. With everything in subjection to him, but at the same time, as we said last week, he's not detached. He's not distant from us. He's also intimately involved in all things, such that there is no way that we can go to hide from him. And that he is an ever-present help in times of need. Amen? Think rightly when we think about who God is. We think rightly when we think about where God is. But Jesus goes on, and this is what we will consider today. To say that we also need to think rightly about what God is. The holiness of God. And in particular, the holiness of his name. And what is required of us as we relate to it. And before we dive in, I think it's important for us to understand this phrase, hallowed be thy name. What does this word hallowed mean? And when you look at the Greek, there is quite a wide range of meaning when we talk about this word hallowed. It can refer to an act of consecration, you know, where you, you cleanse something or you purify something. You, you, you try to do something to make something whole, to sanctify it, to make it holy. Now, of course, that cannot be what it is that Jesus is referring to in this text because God is holy in and of himself and there's nothing we can say or do to change or affect that whatsoever. And so it is the second meaning that is perhaps most apt in this text and it's that the word refers more specifically to the act of reverence, to regard, to honor, or to treat something or someone as holy. So as I see it, this phrase, hallowed be thy name, is intended to help us posture ourselves appropriately as we approach not only a holy father, but a holy father whose holiness extends to his very name. This phrase, hallowed be thy name, should cause us, I believe, to do three things as we fashion our own prayers 
and bring them to our Father who is in heaven. And the first thing that I believe this phrase should cause us to do is to acknowledge the holiness of his name. Now, friends, if you were here last week, we spoke a little bit about the Tetragrammaton. You remember that? That four-letter Hebrew theonym, yod He vav He, transliterated as Y-H-W-H. We pronounce it Yahweh, the Old Testament name for God. And I shared with you how observant Jews do not even say this name. And as Yuanita reminded me, they don't even write it. Out of a sense of reverence and respect for the God of the Old Testament. Something significant in this name. Yes, there are, there are many names for God in the Old Testament, and we could do a deep dive into that. It'll take us months. <laughs> but I found it very interesting. One of the commentators pointed out that there is only one place within the Scriptures where there is any form of an explanation whatsoever about the meaning of this name, Yahweh. And it is in Exodus 3. And you might remember the context God calls Moses, and he says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. And I can imagine Moses thinking, well, you know, this is all well and fine, but what happens when I get there, and they say, well, who do you think you are, coming with all of your proclamations and requirements and requests and all sorts of insinuations? And so Moses is like, well, Who do I say sent me? (laughs) What does God say? I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And most modern translations will have a little bit of a note there that that you would see it. it. It can be translated not only that it. It could be translated not only as I am who I am, but it could be translated as I am that I am, and also I will be what I will be. What an odd response to a question. What is, who, tell me your name, so that when I go there, I can tell them who you sent me. And I love what John Durham says. He says, the answer that Moses receives is not by any stretch of the imagination a name. It's an assertion of authority. It is a confession of an essential reality. Instead of answering him outrightly, God provides Moses with a description of his very being. He says, It's not enough for me to just tell you my name. There's there's something that is within this name that you need to understand. And this is kind of my interpretation of what God says. It's almost as if he says, tell them, the creator, the self-existent one, the sustainer of all things, the Lord of all that is and ever will be has sent you. That's who is sending you. Friends, the Bible and the Old Testament in particular presents God as someone who is extremely concerned, even jealous of his name. So concerned was he that when he issues the very commandments to Moses, he says to them, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God is careful to make it clear that his name is sacred. And it's sacred because it is synonymous with his very personhood. We do not approach the God of the universe in some nonchalant, blase, 
casual fashion. As I said last week, he's not our buddy. When we pray, he's not just our father, he is our holy father. That, Jesus says, is something you must understand and acknowledge. That forms part of your approach to how you pray. This brings me to the second thing that I want to share this morning. And that is, this phrase, hallowed be thy name, should cause us to ascribe holiness to his name. I don't know what your prayer lives look like, but I'll tell you a little bit about what mine looks like. Those of you who might be interested. Often when I come to God, I come to God in a bit of a conversational manner. You know, just for a chin wag. <clears throat> Often I'm busy with some other things. So I'm, I might be out riding my motorbike, you know, through the Michalisberg Mountains. I might be standing in a river fly fishing. I might be in my garage working on a guitar. I might be taking a French bulldog for a walk and just having a chat. And I think that's apt. I mean, that's fair, as you would with your dad, right? Sometimes I come to God in more of a conventional manner, ahead of a very specific something that must happen, an event or maybe a a religious service or a meeting or a, a meal or something like that. It's because it's, it's customary to do that. Sometimes I come to God almost spontaneously when something happens. You know, suddenly someone's in need of prayer and we quickly pray a prayer for them. Or you see something and you just thank him for it. Or, or you're reminded of something and you just bring it to him. So there's that sense of spontaneity as well. And sometimes I'll sit during a Bible reading or a devotion and something will, will, will kind of stand out to me and I'll pray about that. And something that I, I, I wrestle with, and I'll share this with you, I'll, I'll expose myself a little bit, is often at night when I lay my head down to sleep, I'll, as I'm lying there, I'll be thanking God for his mercies and the things that he's given me given us and how good he is and and often I'm still praying those prayers and I'm fast asleep <laughs> and I wake up and I'm like ah oh, you need to be a bit more diligent with this thing now there's there's probably nothing inherently wrong with any of these approaches but as I began to deliberate on my approach it became apparent to me that more often than not, the very content of my prayer is more self-centered than I would like. I, I don't have a physical checklist, but I have a checklist in my mind. And, and often I find my prayers gravitating towards the things that I need to come to God with and ask Him for. And... There's nothing wrong with that. We, we'll get to that in the Lord's Prayer. There's the meeting of our daily needs. But I love what J.I. Packer has to say. He says, were we left to ourselves, any praying we did would both start and end with ourselves, for our natural self-centeredness knows no bounds. Indeed, much pagan praying of this kind goes on amongst supposedly Christian people. But Jesus' pattern tells us, start with God. Friends, this blueprint that Jesus provides suggests that we should not just launch into a request we don't just launch into the agenda that we have. We acknowledge who he is. We acknowledge where he is. We acknowledge what he is. He is holy. And the appropriate thing to do as part of any prayer is not only to acknowledge him, to understand it, but to ascribe holiness to him. What does this word ascribe mean? 
It's to give credit where it's due. It's to go beyond just some passive acknowledgement to actually doing something, saying something. That is what ascribing is. The New International Encyclopedia of the Bible says that the word ascribed within the biblical context is a call to the purest kind of worship. Giving praise to God for who by nature he is. To ascribe holiness to his name is to go beyond a mere acknowledgement to an act of worship. That's why I loved what we did this morning. That's prayer. It's what King David says in Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. This concept of ascribing and worshiping is the same thing. So we've spoken about different approaches to prayer. I've spoken a bit about the content of our prayers. But if prayer is to be an act of worship, what does that say about our posture? You may, may remember in our series on the disciples, I spoke about a genuine disciple being someone who approaches God with the right posture. And I found it fascinating as I was looking this thing up this week that so many biblical characters, Jesus included, knelt to pray. I find it very interesting. I'm not saying that it's wrong to sit and pray. But you don't see it displayed in the scriptures. When we kneel, when we bow our heads, when we prostrate ourselves on the ground, when we stand and we lift our hands, that is an act of worship. And that brings me to the third and final thing that this phrase, hallowed be thy name, should cause us to do when we're fashioning our prayers. And this, friends, is the most fascinating of the lot. I never saw this before. And I'd love to share it with you. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, and we will look at verse 23. And it reads as follows, And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you, and I want to encourage you to consider who this you might be, When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. These are the words of Ezekiel the prophet to a very specific people group in a very specific period of time. But there are messianic underpinnings here, friends. Consider the person of the Lord Jesus and let's read it again. And ask if you see him in the text. I will vindicate my holiness, the holiness of my great name which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And see this, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I will vindicate my holiness before their eyes. These are the words of Ezekiel regarding how God, through the person of the Lord Jesus would ensure that his name would no longer be profaned, but would be hallowed among all nations. When we see the words of Jesus, hallowed be thy name, and we see it from an eschatological perspective, from an end times perspective, this phrase can be seen as a petition for God to bring his plan of salvation to a close, to bring the entire universe to an acknowledgement of his great name by ensuring that every knee bows 
and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That's what Paul says in the book of Philippians, does he not? That in the fullness of time, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, it is through the cross of Jesus Christ that God vindicates his name, ensuring that a corrupt world not only acknowledges him, but responds appropriately. Whether they like it or not, they will bend the knee. That's what the Bible says. This is the message of the cross. That God is holy. That in his holiness he will not tolerate sin. If he were to tolerate sin that would be a compromise and he would cease to be God. In his holiness he demands a payment for sin and that payment is death. But by offering up his very self as a payment for sin, he satisfies his own holy demands. He ensures that no creature can take credit for it. And he ensures that the whole world can look to him not as a vindictive and as a vengeful deity who seeks to exact punishment upon us, but as a loving God who takes his own wrath out upon his own self. That's the gospel. He allows us to come to him freely, acknowledging him and ascribing holiness to his name. This, friends, is an encouragement by Jesus to make an evangelistic appeal for the gospel to spread and for God's plan of salvation to be realized in every corner of the earth. I come to a close and I'll ask the worship team to come up. Can you see how the Lord's Prayer, this blueprint, is more than just a couple of words that we pray when it seems right? There is a depth of meaning to these words. It's a model inviting us to craft our prayers to God in appropriate ways. We come to God the Father, that is who He is. But even as we do so, we must acknowledge that He is almighty, He is transcendent, He is above and beyond all things, but He is also imminent within all things, that is where He is. But Jesus says you must also acknowledge that He is the one and only true and holy God. And that we should respond respond appropriately, approaching his throne room in an attitude of worship. Before we utter a single word in prayer, that should be our posture. I'd like us to sing a final song.